Hello and welcome to All About the Ancient World. Our channel is dedicated to promoting the voices of early career researchers in the studies of the ancient world. This presentation is titled Diplomacy and Security in the Ancient World, Hasminian Roman Relations. It focuses on the geopolitical strategies of the Hasminians and Romans. It is argued that while Rome sought to use the Hasminians as a buffer against their rivals, the Hasminians attempted to use the backing of Rome to imitate both internal and external opponents. It is presented by Lewis Polson. Lewis Polson is a graduate student in the Interdisciplinary Classical, Near Eastern, and Religious Studies Department at the University of British Columbia. His research interests include Greco-Jewish cultural interactions in the Hellenistic period, and Judean political institutions in the Hellenistic and early Roman eras. He was a history and classical studies double major as an undergraduate at Willamette University. His classical studies thesis focused on Josephus's combination of Greek and Jewish literary tropes and the portrayal of three Maccabean kings. Today's presentation stems from his history thesis, which seeks to reevaluate perhaps the earliest interactions between Jews and Romans, the military alliances between the Hasminian dynasty and the Roman Republic. Now, without further ado, please enjoy this presentation all about the ancient world. Hello, my name is Lewis Polson, and I will be presenting an expansion of my undergraduate history thesis entitled Diplomacy and Security in the Ancient World, Hasmonean Roman Relations. This study was advised by Professor Robert Chenault at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. Throughout the second century BCE, there were four different rulers of the Hasmonean dynasty a Jewish regime which controlled Judea, the area directly adjacent to the city of Jerusalem, and increasingly larger regions of Palestine, also known as the Southern Levant, who negotiated several treaties with the Roman Republic. The first treaty was struck in the year 161 BCE, and the relations between these two states continued at least in the, into the 120s BCE, if not further. These treaties are preserved in two sources, the Hasmonean dynastic history, known as First Maccabees, as well as in Antiquities, a 20 volume summation of Jewish history written sometime in the 90 CE by the Roman Jewish historian Josephus. These treaties were military alliances in which each party agreed to defend the other should they be attacked and to refrain from making war on one another's allies. The agreements between these two states became larger in scope over time. John Hyrcanus, the last ruler to negotiate a treaty with Rome, established even more far reaching terms as will be discussed. At first glance, these treaties look out of place, if not entirely ahistorical. Indeed, we have no evidence that the Romans or the Hasmoneans ever aided the other as they had agreed upon. The lack of Hasmonean aid to Rome is less surprising. During the mid second century BCE, as we will see, Roman warfare was centered almost exclusively in the Western Mediterranean, Greece, and Macedonia. And the Hasmoneans simply lacked the resources, power, and influence to aid Rome in any conflicts outside the Near East. But the fact that Rome never intervened to aid the Hasmoneans presents a much greater problem. Indeed, the Hasmoneans were consistently at war throughout the second century and faced numerous internal and external rivals who posed serious challenges to the authority of the Hasmonean state, even in Judea itself. These military alliances, as dictated by First Maccabees and by Josephus then, do not seem to fit the lack of action taken by the Romans, or indeed to match what the Hasmoneans would have realistically been capable of. I will here attempt to place this relationship within a wider geopolitical context, which will help us recognize the importance of these treaties to both regimes. To understand the wider framework within which these negotiations took place, we must first examine the emergence of the Hellenistic kingdoms in the Eastern Mediterranean. In the late fourth century BCE, the Macedonian king Alexander III, otherwise known as Alexander the Great, conquered the Persian empire, which was based in Susa, located in modern Southwest Iran which controlled territory between the Western desert of Egypt all the way up to the Indus River located in modern day Pakistan. Upon Alexander's untimely death in 323 BCE, his generals divided the conquests amongst themselves. By the end of the fourth century, various wars between these competing generals led to the emergence of four kingdoms which came to encompass the vast bulk of Alexander's territory. The two which competed for control of Judea were the Ptolemies here highlighted in dark blue as well as the Seleucids here highlighted in yellow, based in Antioch or modern day Syria, but in this period controlled the vast bulk of Alexander's Eastern conquest, as can be seen on this map. 
Yet even as Alexander's territory was divided amongst rivaling parties, none of the Hellenistic kingdoms ever lost the ideology of reconquering and thus reunifying all of Alexander's conquests. As we will see, this was still true in the twilight of the Hellenistic period when these states were in disarray. This map depicts the territories of these kingdoms in the year 301 BCE. As can be seen here, Palestine was the geographic divider between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, and so was the subject of constant war throughout the third century. When the Seleucids attempted multiple times to retake the region, Judea, as well as Palestine more broadly, was nonetheless defended and kept under Ptolemaic control. In this period, many Jewish communities were thoroughly Hellenized. Many Jews migrated to Alexandria, a sprawling metropolitan in Northern Egypt located here, and some may have even joined the ranks of the Ptolemaic administration. In 200 BCE, Antiochus III, the ruler of the Seleucid Empire, who had already vastly expanded Seleucid holdings in Asia Minor, or modern day Turkey, as well as in Bactria, modern day Afghanistan and Pakistan, advanced south and captured Judea, ending nearly 100 years of Ptolemaic rule over Palestine. Unsurprisingly, Antiochus III followed the standard Hellenistic policies of religious toleration. As long as Judea means political loyalty, its internal political processes and cults would be respected. This changed, however, after Antiochus III's son, Antiochus IV, took the throne and failed to invade Egypt. According to the Roman historian Polybius, Rome sent envoys to Eleusis in 168 BCE to meet the Seleucid king and to confront him with a senatorial decree, which demanded his withdrawal from Egypt. This is commonly known as the Day of Eleusis. The Roman legionary then drew a circle in the sand around the king, and ordered him to state whether or not he would comply with the Senate's ruling before exiting it. Out of options and unable to confront Rome, Antiochus IV was forced to withdraw. It was on his return journey through Judea that the Seleucid king desecrated the temple in Jerusalem and enacted a series of blatantly anti-Jewish laws, such as banning the temple cult. Moreover, he, he instituted pagan rituals within Jerusalem's borders, including his own ruler cult. Much ink has been spilled by modern scholars in speculation over Antiochus's, uh, Antiochus's motives behind these striking events. In my view, the most plausible explanation for this crackdown on local Jewish law is John Ma's claim that the Hasmoneans, as, along with other Jewish groups which resisted these decrees, misinterpreted Antiochus's actions as religious persecution, when in fact the measure was a typical Hellenistic synoikism, or the refoundation of a city as a military colony. This was, this was a common response in the Hellenistic period to perceived unrest and rebellion. Yet in a Jewish context, the simple incorporation of the temple into the Seleucid imperial cult was unacceptable. It was this cultural misunderstanding that led to the Maccabean revolt. Mattathias, according to, the first, according to first Maccabees, murdered a Greek official who told him to sacrifice at a temple in Modi'in, which would have violated Jewish law, and initiated a campaign of, of guerrilla warfare against the Seleucids. Upon his death, his son, Judas Maccabeus, took over the rebel forces and won a series of military victories, likely because of his familiarity with the terrain. In the aftermath of Maccabeus' recapturing of Jerusalem and performing a Chanukah, or rededication, ritually reunifying the temple and advertising Maccabeus' claim to authority, the Hasmonean dynasty emerged as an independent, or at least a semi-autonomous, region regime in Judea. While the Hasmoneans were still in their earliest stages of establishing themselves as an independent state in 161, when the first treaty between these two parties was negotiated, by this period, the Roman Republic had grown to become the dominant military power and political force of the Western Mediterranean. Indeed, just over 100 years had passed since Rome's first military engagement outside the Italian peninsula, the First Punic War, which lasted from, six, from 264 to 241 BCE in which Rome defeated the North African naval power Carthage and captured the islands of the, the island of Sicily, as well as the islands of Sardinia and Corsica. The Republic had also defeated Carthage again in the Second Punic War from 218 to 201 BCE, in which Rome seized the Eastern seaboard of the Iberian Peninsula. Rome had also captured Illyria and Macedonia and had set up numerous proxy regimes in Greek city-states which were allowed to control their internal affairs, but were answerable to the Senate in terms of their foreign policy. Rome had even defeated the Seleucids in the early second century and had fought battles as far east as Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. Yet, the Eastern, yet in the Eastern Mediterranean more broadly, the Republic had still not meaningfully intervened to manipulate the existing Hellenistic geopolitical structure. 
To be sure, Rome did have a strong relationship with the Ptolemies based in Egypt, but the latter kingdom was still not yet directly under Rome's thumb as it would become later. Indeed, as the renowned scholar Eric Gruen notes in his 1984 book, The Hellenistic World and the Coming of Rome, Rome's interest in the East in the second century was quote, fragmentary, intermittent, and rarely intense, unquote. The regime had certainly not intervened militarily anywhere near Judea, much less did it control any territory near the Hasmonean state's holdings. In order to understand the interactions between the Romans and the Hasmoneans, I will incorporate the methodological framework of Arthur Eckstein, who argues in his 2006 analysis of Roman expansion that the Hellenistic Mediterranean functioned as an interstate anarchy in which the only realistic measure of safety a state could rely on was victory in warfare. Within this highly competitive and hostile environment, each state needed to be what Eckstein calls a self-help regime, relying on solely on its own resources for both its economic and political stability and its physical safety. States in this context cannot plan far ahead and so tend to use preemptive military action to drive back other expansionist regimes. After all, even the most powerful states in the Hellenistic Mediterranean were almost brought down within a few years by successive military defeats. This can be seen in the example of the Carthaginian slave revolt, which nearly brought the North African naval power to its knees, as well as the near defeat of Rome at the hands of Hannibal in the Second Punic War. This climate could lead states to hold long-standing and even unrealistic fears of expansionist rivals, on the grounds that being outmatched militarily could easily lead to a regime's collapse. Exine's analysis is invaluable as a framework for understanding Hasmonean Roman relations. Nonetheless, there are serious issues with this model that need to be addressed. Eckstein largely ignores the use of diplomacy as a mechanism of pressuring rivals, and he does, not address the, he does not adequately address the ways in which regimes may have used such diplomatic measures to prevent costly and draining wars. While it must be admitted that military force and violence nearly always formed the backdrop to diplomatic negotiations in the Hellenistic world, the historian of the Hellenistic period, John Ma, has demonstrated that diplomacy non nonetheless had an extremely important function. In his case study of the relations between the city-states of Western Asia Minor and Antiochus III, the Seleucid king, during the late 3rd and early 2nd centuries BCE, Ma shows that while the Hellenistic Mediterranean may not have had international law as we would understand it, there were still recognized customs of diplomacy that did have tangible power. When city-states honored Antiochus with public decrees, Antiochus would then be expected to grant some concession to the city, such as grain provisions, exemption from taxes, or some other benefit. The granting of such a concession, in turn, would compel the city to publicly honor Antiochus and the Seleucid regime, thus initiating a cycle of diplomatic concessions. While there was an obvious imbalance of power in these interactions, to be sure, both parties were nonetheless able to successfully use these diplomatic measures to compel the other to bestow benefits upon them. This does not mean that we must discard Exine's model of an interstate anarchy. Rather, we must remember that even within such an anarchy, diplomatic processes could be used to intimidate both allies and rivals and to create an environment of greater security without the need to resort to warfare. I here argue that within this context, the treaties between the Hasmoneans and the Romans are entirely reasonable and that both parties did indeed gain specific and significant benefits from this relationship. For the Romans, the Hasmonean dynasty, although small, sat at a critical crossroads over which the Senate wished to exert control in order to stabilize the Eastern Mediterranean. Indeed, Palestine geographically represents a frontier zone between Egypt and Syria, which in this period were controlled by the Ptolemies and by the Seleucids respectively. While the balance of power between these two regimes lay outside of direct Roman control, Rome nonetheless saw any large and expansionist state in the Mediterranean region as dangerous and felt obligated to take preemptive action to prevent such a state from gaining enough power that it might be able to threaten Roman interests. We must also consider the long-standing fear of the Seleucids in, particu in particular by the Romans, stemming from the Seleucid incursion into Greece and the resulting Roman Seleucid War at the beginning of the second century. Such memories surely played into recurring senatorial concerns regarding the threat that the Seleucids could pose to Roman safety. Moreover, Palestine had been exploited by the Seleucids for expansionist purposes before. Both Antiochus III and IV invaded Egypt by marching through Palestine. As a small dynasty located at a strategically crucial, crucial position then, 
the Hasmoneans would have been seen by Rome as an extraordinarily valuable ally, which could prevent the need for Rome to intervene militarily in the Near East. The Hasmoneans, a newly formed regime facing constant internal attacks from rivals and from rival claimants to the throne, would have sought to find a state that was powerful enough to back them, yet far enough away that the Hasmoneans would not risk becoming subsumed into the position of a client state. Eckstein demonstrates that this is especially critical for small states to consider within the context of an interstate anarchy in which alliances are helpful, but rarely stable or secure. In the mid second century, Rome fit the bill for such an ally. Because of both Rome's distance from Judea, as well as its internal stability, the Hasmoneans could feel confident that a Roman alliance would allow them to intimidate and to outmaneuver their internal rivals, giving them greater legitimacy against their external enemies, such as the Seleucids. Such use of these treaties for intimidation of rivals, I suggest, presents a much greater benefit for the Hasmoneans than the hope of actual military intervention, which would have severely threatened Hasmonean aspirations for geopolitical independence. Especially in later treaties, once the Hasmonean regime had once the Hasmonean regime had familiarized itself with senatorial objectives, policies, and fears, I argue that the Hasmoneans demonstrate a remarkable ability to manipulate their presentation of the geopolitical situation in the Eastern Mediterranean for their own benefit, over-dramatizing the dangers that the Seleucid state could pose to Rome, which allowed the regime to gain clear concessions, albeit rhetorical ones, from the Senate. The importance of these relations for both states can perhaps best be seen in a treaty conducted by John Hyrcanus, the last of the four kings who negotiated with Rome. This treaty, known as the Fanius Decree, after the name of the Roman official who convened the Senate, not only demonstrates the broad extent of the agreements made between these two parties, but when placed within the context of Hyrcanus's geopolitical priorities, as I will try to do here, it can also reveal the importance of this Roman alliance to the Hasmonean authorities. Early in John Hyrcanus's reign, the Seleucid king Antiochus VII, also known as Antiochus Sedates, invaded Judea and besieged the city of Jerusalem in 134 BCE. Josephus claims that Sedates was still upset over his defeat at the hands of Simon, who was Hyrcanus's predecessor. The siege became so severe that in order to save resources, Hyrcanus was forced to expel the women, the children, and the men of non-military age from the city, leaving them with nowhere to go. Yet it was at this moment, when Hyrcanus was on the brink of being forced to capitulate, that Sedates suddenly withdrew. The noted Josephine scholar Tessa, Tessa Rajak seeks to explain away this particularly bizarre episode by changing the date of Hyrcanus's relations with Rome to the time of this siege, arguing that Roman military intervention, of which there was no mention in the text, forced Antiochus to withdraw. Such a dating re requires Rajak to abandon the accepted chronology for the treaty, which falls in the 120s BCE, and instead redate it into the 130s so that it may coincide with this campaign. Moreover, there is no precedent for the Hasmonean regime reaching out to Rome during a war. And indeed, I argue that such an embassy would not make sense. The Hasmoneans sent to Rome to gain the Senate's backing precisely because Rome was outside the geopolitical context of the Eastern Mediterranean and therefore unlikely to intervene militarily but still invested in bolstering the power of the Hasmonean state for its own interests. The Hasmoneans certainly would not have wanted Roman military intervention, and for the Hasmoneans to send to Rome during wartime would have been to invite intervention. A more reasonable solution, to my mind, is to engage the possibility that Antiochus Sedates withdrew from Jerusalem because he faced threats to his authority at home. Usurpers may have sought to remove Antiochus from power, forcing him to return to Antioch to shore up his authority. The same would happen a few decades later when the Seleucid king Demetrius Achairos defeated the Hasmoneans, but then suddenly withdrew because a pretender had taken the throne. Antiochus VII died soon after this episode in the year 129 BCE on campaign against the Parthians, a rapidly expanding regime based in modern day Iran and a long standing rival to the Seleucids. This left Hyrcanus unhampered by any Seleucid threats and provided him with an opportunity to enact, to enact expansionist policies, as can be seen here by his, by his conquests highlighted in light green, which nearly doubled the size of Hasmonean territory. Hyrcanus first turned north to Samaria, defeating, the, defeating, uh, uh, defeating a number of cities in the region, and even destroying the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim located here. He then turned southeast to Idumea, inhab inhabited by the biblical Edomites, and, uh, and issued a threat to the local population to convert to Judaism or leave. 
This is noteworthy, not only because of how Hyrcanus strategically presents himself you know, to the Romans as far weaker than he actually was, as we will see, but also because this reveals certain key shared priorities between the Hasmoneans and the Romans. Like the Romans, the Hasmoneans themselves were also an expansionist state, benefiting from the internal rivalries that consumed Seleucid forces and enabled them to embark on military conquests. Indeed, as the historian of ancient Jewish history, Seth Schwartz notes in his 2001 book, Imperialism in Jewish Society, the ability of the Hasmoneans to bring conquered peoples into their fold, thus expanding their geographic influence and their ability to establish imperial control, closely, math closely matches the methods of expansion employed by the Roman state in the same period. Yet even as they grew in size, power, and military capability, both states continued to fear the possibility of being challenged or even subsumed by rivals. It was after these widely successful military campaigns that John Hyrcanus conducted his treaty with Rome, most likely in the year 127 BCE. The text of the treaty is quite fascinating because of the remarkably specific concessions from the Senate that Hyrcanus' men were able to elicit. The treaty stipulates that the Seleucids were required to return any cities that Antiochus VII had captured during his siege of Jerusalem, which was, quote, contrary to the, contrary to the decree of the Senate, end quote, back to Hasmonean control. This language of a decree is likely referring to a treaty made between Rome and Antiochus' predecessor, Demetrius I. The Seleucids were also expressly prohibited from marching into Judea under arms. Any laws which Antiochus VII had made, again, that were contrary to the decree of the Senate, were annulled. And lastly, the Senate declared that Roman envoys would travel to Palestine to appraise the value of the land destroyed by Antiochus during the war. Rome is here represented as blatantly interfering in Judean internal politics and in creating legal decrees that were expected to be followed by rulers at Antioch. While these concessions may seem striking, we must recognize that there was no evidence that Rome either ever entered Judea during this period to enforce these provisions or to appraise the destroyed territories as they had promised. But instead of seeing this as a failure for the Hasmonean negotiators, I suggest instead that this decree represents the, the product of a masterful job of Hasmonean diplomacy and sleight of hand to serve their own interests. While we only have the decrees that the Senate passed, as Josephus does not report the arguments that the Hasmonean envoys made to the Senate, these can be reconstructed based on the concessions that the envoys secured. It seems that the Hasmonean representatives used Antiochus Sedates' invasion and siege of Jerusalem to paint an extremely dark picture. We know that Hyrcanus was forced to send away the non-military population of Jerusalem for lack of supplies, which suggests that Antiochus VII was close to forcing the Hasmonean regime to capitulate. Should Jerusalem have been lost, so the Hasmoneans may have warned, the Seleucids could have easily invaded Egypt, creating another Eleusis-like scenario that would have necessitated Roman military intervention. Rome's concrete concessions also suggest that the Hasmoneans stressed a sense of urgency. The longer the Romans waited, the stronger the Seleucids would become, and the more detrimental any Seleucid military action would be to Roman interests. Now let's be clear, this is clearly not an accurate reflection of the geopolitical situation at hand. First, Hyrcanus, coming to Rome after his successful military campaigns, which nearly doubled the size of Hasmonean territory, was not in the same vulnerable position that he had been earlier in his reign. Moreover, by the 120s BCE, the Seleucids controlled little more than Syria and were constantly, were constantly ridden by civil wars, which hamstrung any king from embarking on military conquests. This can be seen in this map in which the Seleucid, the Seleucid Empire controls Syria, the Northern Levant and Cappadocia, this region in, in Southeastern Turkey or Anatolia, and, were re, and was in the midst of a civil war in this period. And that's compared to the Seleucids in the year 301 BCE where they controlled the vast bulk of Alexander's Eastern conquests. Yet there were still moments where the Seleucids could demonstrate their power, such as in the siege of Jerusalem which suggests that the Seleucids still clearly possessed the ideology of reconquering Alexander's empire, even if they lacked the means to enact such a vision. This would have provided the Hasmoneans with the fodder they needed to tap into Roman fears of expansionist regimes that could, that could threaten their growing hegemony and elicit these concessions. These decrees also match the ultimatums issued by Rome to their Hellenistic rivals in earlier periods, Indeed, it seems that the Hasmoneans had caused the Roman Senate to begin the diplomatic negotiations that were usually meant to prevent warfare or to justify, Roman mili or to justify military action if it did become necessary. 
But after Antiochus VII's withdrawal from Jerusalem and his death fighting against the Parthians, the Seleucids were not in a position to resist these Roman demands as they were too consumed by internal factionalism. Any military action was therefore avoided, just as the Hasmonean envoys seemed to have intended. From this scare tactic, the Hasmoneans were able to boast seemingly clear and concrete relations with the Roman Senate, which they could use to intimidate internal and external rivals. In sum, these interactions must be understood as having occurred in an interstate anarchy in which states could not adequately trust one another or use any international law to defend themselves. To survive, states needed to be self-sufficient, relying on their brute strength to appear as strong as possible and deter any potential rivals. Yet I have also suggested that states did not simply desire warfare for its own sake. Warfare is costly, it drains resources, and, prevents, and presents significant risk, even for the largely dominant Roman state. Instead, it was often far safer to use diplomatic measures to intimidate potential rivals and to reserve warfare only as a last resort. We have seen that both the Romans and the Hasmoneans conformed to this model of international relations. Both states faced expansionist militaristic rivals and needed to be preemptively aggressive to survive. This did sometimes take the form of violence, as in the Roman Seleucid Wars at the beginning of the second century, or from the Hasmonean perspective, when Hyrcanus used military force to conquer Samaria and Idumea and incorporate these peoples into his regime. But the relations between the Hasmoneans and the Romans also served to demonstrate that both parties preferred diplomacy to warfare. The Romans hoped that the Hasmoneans would prevent any Seleucid aggression that would necessitate Roman military intervention. The Hasmoneans hoped that Roman backing would ward off any rivals and deter Seleucid attacks before the state needed to engage them militarily. In order to gain the concessions needed for these ends, the Hasmonean negotiators worked to manipulate their presentation of the geopolitical situation in the Eastern Mediterranean, playing on Roman fears for their own interest. This new context allows us to explain why there is such explicitly militaristic language in these treaties, yet no evidence of actual military intervention. For the Hasmoneans and the Romans, this outcome was a success. The treaties served their purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching Diplomacy and Security in the Ancient World, Hasmonean Roman Relations, presented by Lewis Polson. If you have any questions about the content of this lecture, please leave a comment below. If you liked this video and want to see more, click subscribe and make sure to hit the notification bell to get updates for future videos. Also, be sure to check out our website linked in the description below. You can also follow us on social media so that you never miss an update. Finally, if you're an early career researcher and you have an idea for a lecture, please take a look at the call for papers on our website and consider applying today. Our next deadlines are April 1st and June 1st, 2022. We hope you enjoyed learning all about the ancient world and we'll see you in the next video.